All right, I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, really, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I was hoping some of my comrades from California would, would get on, but maybe in a little while. Uh, just want to welcome uh, everyone to the second in a new series that the DSA Fund is doing uh, discussions on how we win. This new series will focus on DSA chapters and coalitions that won victories at the ballot box and through enacting new laws that made people's lives better. These conversations aim to complement DSA's organizing with a series on how to win policy campaigns and what happens when these victories become law. The key theme for tonight's event is how we win winning worker rights campaigns. We'll be focusing on workers' campaigns and resulting policy implementation in Texas, Maine, and New York City. This event is co-sponsored by the Democratic Socialists of America Fund, DSA's National Labor Committee, the NYC Chapter Labor Branch, and Debt and Finance Working Group, Convergence, Dissent, and In These Times Magazines, and LEP. I'm your moderator, Michael Lighty. I am the president of Healthy California Now, representing the National Union of Healthcare Workers. I've also served in the labor movement and other leadership roles. I was the national director of the Democratic Socialists of America a while ago, and currently sit on the Medicare for All Committee of DSA. In addition to myself, the panelists for tonight's discussion on how we win local workers' rights campaigns are Justine Carr is a member of NYC DSA, daughter to a New York City taxi driver, and a former city council candidate who organized in the campaign to win major debt relief for taxi drivers in New York City. Kate Sykes is co-chair of Maine DSA, which organized in a coalition to pass a Green New Deal ballot measure with fair wages fair wage provisions, and a $15 minimum wage ballot measure with hazard pay. Ana Gonzalez worked as a fierce advocate for immigrant workers at Workers Defense Project in Austin, Texas, where she helped organize and lead a successful campaign for a local paid sick leave ordinance in coalition with Austin DSA and others. She is now Deputy Director of Policy and Politics for the Texas AFL-CIO. The first half of the panel discussion will center on questions I asked the panelists as moderator. And in the second half, the panelists will answer questions that you ask in the Q&A. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to post your questions as they come to you during the discussion. The Q&A box will be open the whole time and someone will be keeping track of the questions for part two. And now for part one of the panel discussion. We're anxious to get to as many of your questions as possible, so we've asked the panelists to limit their responses to three minutes each. So starting with the first question, uh, the campaigns that we represent reflect the common goal of socialists, workers' rights as a central activist in political struggle. Your fights both happen within and beyond organized labor and unions. This is especially noteworthy in the current context of an upsurge in worker militancy and union organizing. How does this context and inside outside vantage point affect your strategy? Kate, would you like to start? Sure, thanks, Michael. Um, so in Maine DSA, our chapter was formed um, by a bunch of old labor folks um, back in 20, I think 16, 2017. Um, and so we had quite a few very seasoned labor organizers as members of our chapter. Um, and also in leadership, we had our, our co-chairs um, had come out of the labor leadership um, world. Um, and so we had quite a lot of, of people inside our chapter who were very familiar with labor organizing. Um, we also had uh, an, an ex-mayor, so the mayor who was defeated in an election right before our campaign dropped in 2020, um, was also very uh, friendly with labor and had a lot of contacts within labor. So that helped a lot to tee up the strategy of our referendum campaign. Um, and th the coalition work that developed out of that was really critical to us being able to pass um, 
the both the Green New Deal, which had labor pr provisions in it, as well as the minimum wage um, referendum. And so some of the, the things that happened there, for instance, um, we had uh, the union carpenters come out and help us install signs. These we had these huge, you know, five foot um, plywood signs that most of us didn't have trucks to be able to cart those around. So that was really cool to have those guys come out with their, you know, their drills and whatever, help us with that. Um, and then all, they also donated money, which was really important um, to the campaign as well. It's not something that, um, you know, we talk about a lot in DSA, but that was a critical component to be able to run a successful campaign. Um, and then I think uh, another really important part of the strategy was that we we knew that we wanted that coalition. And so there were things we didn't do in the campaign um, that we maybe wanted. Um, for instance, we really thought uh, about having a fossil fuel ban as part of the Green New Deal, but we have such um, a, a large amount of infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure, and the trades are very heavily involved in those legacy industries. And so while we wanted that as a part of it, we felt that that would divide the coalition and we couldn't really afford to do that. So we instead, we um, put forward a fossil fuel uh, report. So they, it was basically um, looking at the infrastructure and reporting on that, potentially down the road, having a fossil fuel ban. Um, the other thing that we did not do was, um, uh, have abolished the sub tip minimum. Um, Portland is a restaurant town and we have a lot of servers and we felt that that would divide our working class base if we abolish the sub minimum wage for tipped workers. Um, so those are those are some strategic choices that we made in the campaign. Fantastic. Uh, uh, just lean. Yeah, there's so much to touch on. I, I don't even know where to begin, but I guess uh, D DSA side, um, you know, from before the taxi workers campaign, uh, we had just come off a really fresh and exciting um, invest in our New York campaign to tax the rich. We passed an amazing set of bills um, that included nail salon workers um, or parts of the excluded workers for the advocating for the excluded workers fund, whether they were domestic workers, deliveristas or delivery food workers, folks in the informal gig economy, which is really, really inspiring. And then with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance or NYTWA, they're with AFL-CIO, the members pay dues, but it's not a union in the same way that say 32 BJ or SEIU are. There's an executive director in Beta V Desai um, who also began NYTWA in her twenties, literally just surveying taxi drivers at airports and outside restaurants. So I think there was a natural affinity where DSA runs by the rank and file and NYTWA makes those same kinds of um, decisions. Everything is democratically decided, um, but there is no local. And if there is, it's New York Taxi Workers Alliance Local One in New York City probably. Um, but it made for really robust weekly Friday night meetings. Um, we would phone bank our members while we were occupying City Hall. So we weren't just standing there and rallying. And while that was really important and making noise outside City Hall, we were calling up members, shifting them to be outside City Hall and getting their commitments to go on hunger strike. And that decision to go on hunger strike was also made democratically to find who could actually um, give so much of themselves, given that so much of the Taxi Workers Alliance membership is very old, very like 55 and older, um, immigrant, South Asian, and often facing um, chronic health issues as well. So it's really important that that solidarity was there internally and across organizations here as well. Um, but it also made the organizing itself so interesting because um, you know there, this was more of a regulatory fight than a legislative one. Um, but it had the typical elements of getting electeds to sign on to letters from the full New York City congressional delegation and city council, labor support letters, um, and it all culminated in almost a 20 year fight to regulate the taxi industry while Uber and Lyft encroached in California and in New York to absorb and displace the industry. Um, so for us, it was a really, really interesting fight where we needed member leaders to step up um, from the Alliance. Um, we needed as many organizations that organized informal gig workers who weren't exactly part of a union and the formal unions that are the ones who actually decide the elected's futures too. And in that sense, it was member leaders organizing against an entire city that manufactured an economic crisis in the medallion industry, um, which I can explain a little bit more in detail, but medallions are basically a license to own and operate your own vehicle. 
and it's your unique medallion number. So my dad's is 5F27. It's that number and letter code that you see at the top of your taxi. Um, and it was just really inspiring to see um, these older immigrant workers coming together for this fight with democratic socialists in New York City. Oh, amazing, thank you so much. Anna? Thank you, Michael. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and talk about the work that we did here in Austin, Texas and in other cities in Texas. Um, it's, I agree, it's really hard to like put this in like three minutes, but I'll try my best to do that. Um, for a little bit of like context, like I think really like a lot of movement organization and, and labor, you know, we have worked together in many campaigns for, for many, many years. And that's something very unique to Texas and, and something that I, I really, really love. Um, I, I remember that we were coming out, you know, after the Trump election, walking into a legislative session here in Texas, our legislature meets every two years. So we were walking into a, le a legislative session where um, Republicans were very emboldened and had a just horrible agenda that was targeting so many issues in so many of our communities. And coming out of that, our, you know, many of our organizations, we came together and start having conversations on like, how can we come together and really put a uh, forward and a, uh, an idea, an agenda a campaign that is going to be led by workers, right? That is going to build power for workers in our city and is gonna bring us together. And PaidSig really did that, right? Because work is something that connects us all. And it was just so incredible for us to be uh, and see and build a coalition that was so broad and so diverse. We had Unite Here, we had Workers Defense Project, which at the time I was, and I uh, was uh, working for that organization, which is a worker center uh, that is based in, in Texas. Um, the Texas FLCIO, we had, uh, Center for Public Policy Priorities, which focuses on research and creating policy at the state. And uh, Austin DSA and the Young Active Labor Leaders, reproductive justice groups and environmental groups, just so many different groups that came together and we just built an incredible campaign that had uh, you know, direct action and included research and included elected officials that from the inside, our city leaders were really like organizing other council members and really like pushing to making sure that we would come out with a policy that would cover all workers because that was a priority for us. We wanted to make sure that all workers, regardless of size and industry that they work on, they would be covered by this. And in Austin, you know, over, 2,000, over 200,000 workers didn't have access to paid sick, primarily workers in lower um, industry, lower wage industries. So it just like really, as I was thinking about this today and like the different, you know, actions and press, uh, press conferences and theaters and so many different things that we put together and we did it with this just broad uh, coalition from so many different groups. It was just something that it really brought um, energy to you know folks in Texas, and then you know we didn't stop there and went to San Antonio and Dallas to try to do the same thing in those cities. So it was just really incredible to see all of us coming together from the many different groups that I just mentioned uh, and making sure that we would pass the first basic ordinance in Texas. Congratulations. I, I'm so impressed with these different campaigns because they show uh, a real um, strategic smartness to it, making, you know, good, but sometimes tough choices and how to design the campaign and implement it. But but the bottom line for all of them is that it's worker led and it puts uh, workers um, interests first and at the end it uh, in, engages in these diverse tactics so that the workers are fully empowered and participant in the campaigns. And I think that's really significant because we're in this context where the federal administration is much more favorable to unions and certainly the um, decisions and actions coming out of the general counsel, the National Labor Relations Board, which governs union organizing in the country. It's a interesting 
you know, set up where there's a huge role for the federal government in regulating the ability of workers to organize. And so depending on which way those decisions go uh, at the Labor Relations Board, and in particular, how the general counsel interprets the law, that can create a favorable or unfavorable environment for worker organizing. And so we've had very favorable decisions around uh, even things like what are called captive audience meetings, right, where the boss is able to force workers to hear anti-union propaganda. Um, and that's just been kind of part of the deal, but now it's under scrutiny as an unfair labor practice. And there are other, other bigger changes too that, that are in, um, perhaps in the works, including uh, requiring employers to recognize a union when a majority of workers sign cards, which has been off the table for literally decades, even though it was originally part of the National Labor Relations Act. But I think those changes, they do also reflect the mobilization of workers. First of all, they're of no value if workers aren't in motion and organizing. And secondly, because workers are in motion and organizing, those uh, the administration has to respond. And particularly you saw with the Amazon Labor Union, uh, you know, elected the president coming out in favor of that. That was very much a worker led um, effort. And in fact, it was the worker committees in the facility that really distinguished, I think, um, organizing there from other uh, campaigns in Amazon even. And again, I think the changes at the, at the National Labor Relations Board reflect that, but also are, are um, really without consequence unless workers are in motion. And I think all of your campaigns really demonstrate the same thing, that they literally don't happen unless they're worker led and engage workers uh, at, at the levels that you've, you have done so. Uh, let me uh, turn to the next question. The organizing challenges we face as democratic socialists look different across the country. And each of the campaigns highlighted on tonight's panel responded to different opportunities to push policy toward workers' rights and economic justice. Given the unique challenges and opportunities you faced, what organizing strategies, such as the choice of a ballot measure versus a city council campaign, how you position the issue politically and your choice of messaging, how did these organizing strategies, how did your campaign find them successful or what strategies did you find unsuccessful? Jocelyn? Yeah, you know, I think with especially the taxi workers campaign, it was something like a 20 plus year long fight, um, you know, since its inception with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. And, you know, like you mentioned, you know, I was very lucky to be able to see the, you know, Amazon Labor Union in Staten Island, all that work come to a fruition. People are like, wow, Bernie Sanders and AOC came to Staten Island, but it was organizers, um, not only just Christian Smalls, but people like Justine Medina, who spent many lonely tabling hours outside their facilities to organize their coworkers. And that's exactly what, what happened with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. And so I think so many things went right timing-wise for this to come to a natural head. And so, you know, when the pandemic hit in, in 2020, it showed a very clear and distinct to New York's um, ridership for taxi drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers dropped to about 20, 25%, maybe 30. And the remaining drivers would be the ones doing food delivery for families impacted by COVID-19, putting themselves at risk while they were struggling to put food on their own tables because they owed money on their medallions. And so the Taxi Workers Alliance organized against the New York State Department of Labor with Uber and Lyft members to pay app-based drivers back pay that they were owed for unemployment benefits. And so, you know, the Taxi Workers Alliance is known for shutting down the city, for testifying together, training each other and all of these things. And it created incredible conditions for the medallion debt campaign um, to take off the following year in 2021 um, for a battle over what's called the city-backed guarantee for medallion debt forgiveness. And so, like I said, medallions are the license to own your vehicle, but they can be bought, they can be sold and considered an asset on the medallion market. Um, and without getting like too wonky about the economic details, you know, the, under the Bloomberg administration, prices for that medallion went from something like $100,000, $200,000 in 2002 to being up to a million dollars in 2014. And so you had Mayor Bloomberg trying to fill a $4 billion 
citywide budget gap with artificially inflated medallion prices that were sold to working class immigrants, many of whom were South Asian immigrants, just like my father, and were promised it as a ticket to economic stability. And so when pandemic hit, it created this very natural two New Yorks of markets failing as we expected them to, but the city betting on working class immigrants' lives for it, for profit. New York City made profits of up to $80 million while cab drivers fell into half a million dollars in debt on average, and nine drivers ended up taking their own lives. So there were very clear consequences um, for what two administrations did, whether it was Bloomberg or de Blasio, where the, the market was weaponized to continue putting a wedge between the working class and the extremely wealthy. And, you know, like I had said, we had just passed a huge measures on tax the rich at the state level. And the same mayor, Mayor de Blasio, was about to end his tenure as mayor. And so the New York Taxi Workers Alliance saw this as the perfect moment to escalate even further what has already been created over 20 something years. And it was essential for us to make sure as socialists in DSA to follow the New York Taxi Workers Alliance lead and make sure that we wouldn't let a second mayor leave this city without fixing a crisis. And I think so much worked well, and I don't really know that I would have changed too much to be honest, but you know, children of cab drivers were engaged. The rank and file always came before electeds and other groups. And there was an insane media blitz behind it all that showed very clear profits made by you know um, predatory lenders in the same way that the housing crisis um, preyed on um, and offered subprime lending to people hoping to you know make good promises on their kids and invest in a home in the same way that they did for the taxi industry and you know when i ran for city council i made it a priority that if elected i would take this issue as my first one and you know while i didn't win this race i kept my promise to continue organizing for the same communities that raised me the same ones that were in crumbling debt, just like me, the ones that were on food stamps and had their houses on tax liens, just like me. And I'm extremely grateful for that opportunity. And I think that this is such a historic win that many people, um, New York Times included, didn't think was going to happen. Um, but it was because of this escalation from um, shutting down streets, shutting down bridges, to occupying City Hall to going on hunger strike for 15 days. I was on hunger strike for eight days of that 15 um, that allowed for this, for these conditions to be possible and for us to actually win. All right, thank you. Always a bonus to prove the New York Times wrong. How can we resist? All right, Anna. Yeah, so I think that, you know, as we have this conversation, just thinking in the context of like doing anything in Texas is just going to be so different and, and really, really hard. Um, but honestly, like we've seen time to time that the state fails our communities. It failed us during COVID. It failed us in Texas during the winter storm where the lights went out and there was absolute no response from the state and cities really stepped up. And we've seen this time to time in so many campaigns for the time that I've been doing this work where cities really step up and cities respond to the needs of their communities and listen to their constituents and just really do the work. So for us, as we were thinking of, and, and, and then to add all of this, we, every other year, again, we're fighting against a Texas legislature that it's coming for our communities and so many issues attacking workers, you know, Texas, we know is a right to work state, and it's just not a state where we're going to be passing a paid sick days bill that is going to be covering all workers at all, you know. So really, as we were thinking about this, it was an opportunity for us to mobilize and to engage people. And we started in Austin, and we did it really to you know, making sure that workers were going to be at the center and workers were going to be lifting up their voices and sharing their stories and sharing why anyone should have to make the decision between paying their rent or being able to stay home and take care for their families. This is a common sense, basic right that everyone should have access to. And time to time, when we were having this conversation, it wasn't really an argument, right? It was, it was 
really, it was an understanding that we need, everybody ha needs to have the right to, to this basic right. So um, we really, we had like, you know, we had our strategy meetings and conversations, talking to members from each of our organizations and thinking what this policy could look like. Um, and then we had a big launch on Labor Day where we had dozens of folks come out and, you know, talk about how we we're going to uh, launch our campaign. And it was just incredible to see the support from the community. We had many local small businesses that were part of this campaign that understand that this is important for them and for their business, right, to work, to take care of their employees and to um, offer benefits and just like it, it, it benefits them more than anybody else. So we had this just outpouring support from uh, from many folks uh, and used so many tactics. Austin DSA um, canvassed and knocked on and collected thousands of signatures from people supporting this campaign. They were doing blitzes and businesses and just talking to workers and again, making sure that we were centering the experiences and voices of of workers from many industries, from workers that are union, non-union, documented and documented, and that had access to paid sick and didn't have access to paid sick. So it was it was really a a, a strategy thinking of we are going to do this in Austin, building up to uh, going and moving to San Antonio in Dallas, and then we decided, and that was going to do going to that was going to that we did that through a ballot initiative. And again, just talking to voters, these are issues that people care for, that people want. So when you're talking about, you know, the Texas legislation, legislature prioritizing issues that are politicized that have nothing to do with or have no impact in the lives of working Texans, this is, this is you know, this is something that people understood and people want. So it was just our, way of doing year-round organizing and really just bringing in people uh, to the table and engaging them in this campaign and then getting them ready to uh, fight at the legislature because we knew that they were going to come and gonna try to, and they're still trying to take this uh, away from us. All right, Anna, thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, Kate? Yeah, so I'm I'm struck by the fact that we're a city of 65,000 people and we have um, two campaigns that are in, involved really large cities. Um, and so I, it's, yeah, this it's amazing to be here with <laughs> this group of people. Um, one of the things I think that's really important for organizers in small cities like mine um, is that, you, you know, the nuts and bolts of organizing will not fail you. Um, the idea that you need to do a power map, that you have to have a target, you need to know your base, all of that stuff. Um, even when a pandemic hits and all of the ideas that you had for your campaign have to go in a totally different direction because you no longer have a primary to collect petition signatures and you can't collect in person because everyone's afraid of dying. And like, I mean, all of these things, if you just stick to the plan, it will it will carry you through to a new vision of, because that's what happened to us, right? So I think one of the most important things strategically with our campaign is that we, so we had this history um, starting with our own paid sick leave campaign that um, didn't end up coming to fruition that was actually based on the, on the Austin, Texas one, um, to all the way to, um, I think the most recent thing that happened um, before we started this campaign was that we got kicked out of our meeting space in City Hall. So we had been meeting there as a DSA chapter for a long time in public space and the city manager's office finally decided enough is enough with these crazy socialists and we were not allowed to meet in City Hall anymore. So through that entire time, we were starting to realize that the city manager had all of the power in Portland and he was the person that could give us our goals. If we, our, he could fulfill our demands if he wanted to. And so we made the city manager the target of our petition campaign. And that was the thing I think that really crystallized this campaign for us. And it's entirely due to the Black Lives Matter movement because when all of that those cascading effects started happening in Portland and there were thousands of people marching through the streets, their demand ended up being abolish the city manager. And so that just absolutely crystallized the whole campaign for us. 
Um, not only did it help us to win those um, initiatives and to help institute the um, highest minimum wage in the Northern Hemisphere um, and to get hazard pay uh, and uh, fair um, uh, prevailing wage provisions, OSHA training, um, apprenticeships for union workers, all of that stuff happened because we had this laser focus on having a target and understanding that. Um, and so when, when that happened, um, not only did we win that campaign, but we also went on to open our charter. And we are now in the process of retooling that office and making our city a, a mayor council, a bicameral government. Um, so, so we didn't, not only did we, I'm sorry, we ran that city manager right out of town, he's no longer working here, um, but, we, but we also um, are completely retooling our city government. So um, stick to the nuts and bolts, they won't fail you. DSA has a great tutorial on that that you can get online. Um, yeah, that's my advice. All right, Lydia, little city maybe, but big accomplishments. That's fantastic. The um, I'm really struck uh, in in listening to you all that that uh, these campaigns, though they're for immediate reforms of some significance, quite frankly, because they're going to directly improve workers' lives. But there's they they're put in the context of this broader systemic socialist critique, say, of capitalist markets, right, or of um, the uh, position of workers or in, in the structure of city government, right? And it, to, to the point where the public space is denied to the public, you know, and in the form of kicking you out of city hall. And so this, the, con the context for the campaigns never doesn't seem like lose sight of the bigger picture that as socialists, we're always bringing to bear our critique of capitalism, our critique of how the political economy is structured, and the central role that worker organizing and worker fight back plays in that. I'm always, you know, I've spent some time in Texas, on a, and it really, the working class of Texas, uh, if organized and class conscious, could take over that state. It is literally the Goliath that, um, you know, uh, is increase. I think increasingly powerful. And as it as it as it comes to um, be better organized and comes to that kind of class consciousness, one you could transform Texas. I mean, it, the state doesn't run without the multiracial working class, particularly Latino workers and Black workers in, in Texas. It simply doesn't exist. And so, I think that. Um, you know, the, and that's true for all of our cities. Obviously, it's true for cities like New York or Los Angeles, right? And um, once we understand, you know, the kind of uh, structural basis for how um, power is organized in our cities, and then you make these kind of strategic choices that you've made, really, that enables these campaigns to win. I think it's it's quite quite impressive. So, thank you. Uh, let's let's turn to outcomes. Uh, let's turn to the outcomes of these organizing victories. And each of these campaigns resulted in tangible legislative victories for workers and employment rights, as we've seen. What was won and what, if anything, was lost in the legislation that resulted from these organizing campaigns? And let's uh, start with you, Anna, this time. Yeah, I think that first, like, after winning the Asa Pays Day campaign, which was on February 15 of 2018, of months of organizing, months of discussions and stakeholder uh, meetings and conversations with council members and pushback from the National Restaurant Association and the Texas Restaurant Association and all of this uh, Koch brothers back organizations that were coming into our city to try to stop us from, from doing this. I think we made history that night. We really made history and we set the path to uh, do the same and, and continue to organize in San Antonio and in Dallas. Um, but really as, you know, as we would, we were going through this process and just um, having conversations around uh, who should be covered, how many hours, who shouldn't be covered. Like this, there's, there was a lot of just pushback, even sometimes from our allies and internally and like having to navigate those things, those those were definitely um, things that at the end, we did not give in on our priority, which was that all workers should be included. And that, that, was, an, an, that was a non-negotiable. I think too that, again, dealing with the Texas legislature, this is just 
Like we deal with preemption on every single issue. We deal with preemption on homelessness, on defund the police, um, on you know anything that you can think of, on rest breaks for construction workers. Like this is just something that we face time after time in every every two years in Texas. Um, but I think that really, you know, uh, and then too, of course, uh, dealing with this big uh, interest group and, and, and um, big business groups, unfortunately, uh, two of our uh, ordinances, the Austin and San Antonio never went into effect. So I think that that is a big loss for us because workers, you know, we continue to organize workers, we're in it, we were talking about like doing outreach and setting up like educational uh, uh, pieces for making sure that everybody knew their rights for paid sick. But unfortunately, uh, a month after the ordinance passed, uh, uh, the attorney general and many interest groups uh, filed a lawsuit against Austin. And then after San Antonio passed, there was an injunction. Uh, it did go into effect in Dallas, which this is a whole, this is a really long story, but uh, in Dallas, we did not get the number of signatures that we needed to put it in the ballot. So we ended up going back through our uh, city council process and passed that in April of 2019, as we were also trying to stop the legislature from prohibiting it, it us from doing that. Um, it did go into effect in Dallas, and then a federal court, again, after this, um, special groups file a lawsuit, uh, it was, uh, in, it, there was an injunction. And this happened when COVID was, it was in March or April when COVID was happening back in 2020. And it was just uncomprehensible that we were in this, we were in the middle of a pandemic and they were still taking paid sick from us. So I think that that is, you know, coming out of paid sick, although it, honestly, it's to me, something that I am most proud, like I am most proud to have been part of this uh, campaign and be in, in, in the room with all the people that put so many uh, hours and work and their talents to make sure that we were, uh, that we were gonna be successful. Um, but definitely having, you know, having to work with an assistant that is just working against you is something that it's, it's, it's a loss. All right. Well, a, a sobering tale for sure, but they often are out of Texas, unfortunately, and particularly with the um, elected state leaders you've got. I mean, it's quite quite extraordinary, though, that the victories you're able to achieve when you are, you know, organizing workers at the local level. Uh, I think a lot of people think that, well, oh, Austin's a liberal city, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, right. Uh, the National Restaurant Association, I think they're behind every bad thing. <laughs> when it comes to worker rights in the, everywhere in the country. I mean, it's unbelievable, really. Um, all right, enough editorializing. Uh, Kate? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the lawsuit is the thing that um, it, it plagues us all with these campaigns, because as soon as you win something, you know, you net, then you're in the courts. Um, and so with our minimum wage campaign, it wasn't like three weeks after the election when the Chamber of Commerce and a series of a bunch of businesses um, sued the city of Portland over the hazard pay provision in our minimum wage referenda. Um, and that ended up um, being really difficult because um, when you have an organizing campaign and you're, you're doing all this work um, with people on the streets and it's very visible, suddenly your campaign goes into a courtroom and it, there's just no way you can organize around that, right? And the other thing is that you end up having um, to pull in coalition partners that we may not think as kind of natural coalition partners for our campaigns in DSA, um, but like NGOs, lawyers, people with you know lots of like legal chops. Um, and so that was a, a big shift for us. So that was really challenging. We ended up um, losing the um, the fight over the hazard pay provision. Um, in terms of when it was to go into effect, we wanted it to immediately go into effect that January after the election. Um, but they ruled that it should not go effect, into effect until 2022. And by that time, we were actually in a big COVID surge. I think it was the Delta variant that was happening. 
Um, and so that would have really protected workers that were out on the front lines. Um, but at that moment, when um, that went into effect, uh, the city council uh, took away their emergency declaration order. So then it no longer would have triggered this hazard pay. So we, you know, that was really, really unfortunate, but it was a great learning moment. We really understood how these things work after doing that. Um, and I think that sort of the lesson there is make sure that you are prepared for a lawsuit. Um, and, uh, and and have all the pieces in place. The other thing I think that we was a misstep for us is that we didn't have a plan in place to start doing labor organizing um, using the loss of that lawsuit as agitation. Um, we had all of these restaurant workers, uh, or sorry, grocery store workers, um, including Whole Foods workers, um, who either didn't have the hazard pay provision or lost the hazard pay provision because of that lawsuit. And if we had had labor organizing teed up to kind of be there to catch those workers and to organize them, I think we would have organized the entire city. Um, but we just didn't have the infrastructure and we didn't have those contacts within the appropriate unions to be able to, to do that. So that was a, a big lesson for us to learn there. All right, fantastic. Um, one almost thinks that the judicial system is designed to protect property rights. All right, just lean. <laughs> Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> I mean, it's so much, you know, came out of this. There were so many victories, but then also a lot of things that we struggled with afterwards in the same way um, that Kate and Anna were also, um, I think for us, like one thing um, that always like comes to mind is like that, this like rallying chant we had, it was uh, de Blasio lied and drivers died. And that's exactly what happened. And so I think there was a lot of grief over the nine drivers who took their own lives because of insurmountable debt that the city manufactured and it didn't have to be that way and so it was these stories that we really had to carry and uh you know the new york city debt and finance working group just led these insanely amazing teach-ins um that helped educate the communities about um why this was a necessary fight to dive into strike support um, with NYC DSA at large, who brought us like Gatorade and water and blankets when we were, um, you know, uh, still on hunger strike, uh, people who went on solidarity hunger strikes, you know, I'll, I'll never forget there was um, Augustine Tang and Richard Chow who would sleep in their cabs overnight holding down the protest site because that's just how committed they were to this fight um, and to fight for their brothers who didn't have this together. Um, when it was time to testify before the city council, we testified. When it was time to share a meal before we went on hunger strike, we did that together. Um, nobody got thrown under the bus. And I think that's what made this legislation or this regulatory measure so successful. Um, every lender had to come to the table. Um, every worker was part of the decision-making process and we made the commitment to continue organizing Uber and Lyft. And I'll never forget at the victory party when Baita V. Desai, who's the executive director of the Taxi Workers Alliance, told us that what's next is to build a union, to call your comrades, have them pay their dues so that we're bigger for the next fight. And I, I think we'll get into that part um, a little bit next because the union is stronger because of it. But with what we fought for, we pretty much got everything. Um, with the demands. It had gone on for so long. We had gotten every um, Congress member that rep represented in New York City, the state legislature, city councils, we had every, the labor unions, we had everyone you could possibly need to get this. We got a city back guarantee um, that would make sure that in case um, the debt repayment program um, made sure that nobody would default on their loans because of inability to pay back. Um, there was a $170,000 cap on the amount that drivers would have to own back. Um, so before I mentioned the average debt that somebody owed would be about half a million dollars, bringing that down to 170,000 was insanely huge. Um, the interest rates over 20 years were reduced to 5% and the monthly payments went down to about $1,100 a month, whereas some people were paying close to four to 5,000. Um, and similar to you know, what we've been discussing this whole time, you can't pay rent, you can't pay for out-of-pocket healthcare costs. You can't feed your family if all of your money is going towards repaying debt. Um, and so, you know, we won a lot in this process. And we actually, I like to think we had a hand in removing the commissioner of the New York City TLC, which is the Taxi and Limousine Commission. She resigned after not only shouting expletives at employees, um, we made her a target and we made the mayor a target. 
especially after she told a cab driver, one of our New York Taxi Workers Alliance members um, who lamented all of the driver suicides that happened within the union, she told him, you need to stop talking about all that suicide stuff. And it was so clear that the people who tried to cover up the immense amount of profits that were made over this, the predatory lending had no stake in protecting the working class immigrants of the city who literally kept it running when there was nobody else. And so, you know, for us, it was really special that when we were on 15 days of hunger strike, we were together. When there was a vigil for those drivers, we were together. When we were outside city hall for 45, 46 days, we were there together. And so, so much was won on top of that. I think now we're facing the fallout of having um, more um, uh, of the medallion lenders coming on board to the plan and making sure that they're all coming to the table. Um, but I'm really just thankful that um, so much more came out than just making sure nobody has to take their own life because of the debt that they owe this city. Yes, we're reminded of what essential workers gave their health and lives. So thank you, Jocelyn. Um, we're, we're getting a little, we're a little over time, so I we'll have to be a little short uh, on this last question. We've answered half of it anyway. We were talking about what kind of pushback we got, uh, particularly from uh, interests of capital. Um, but the other, and then the other uh, part of this question is, I think, reflected in some of the answers. What comes next? And you um, have talked about the importance of organizing unions. So maybe just, a, a, you know, just briefly, a couple minutes each on um, what are the next steps for economic justice in your community uh, and, and in your view around the country based upon your experience in these campaigns, uh, starting with Kate. Um, yeah, so this kind of folds into just another challenge that we had with our uh, with our campaign was that enforcement became um, a real question, um, and we realized how important it is to write enforcement provisions into any sort of um, legislation that you that you want to pass, um, because with our Green New Deal. Um, there, there is no uh, labor department at the city. Uh, we have one at the state, but um, now we're starting to pass things, um, labor provisions that are actually stronger at the city level. And so we need some sort of an office to be able to um, get data from, collect data, study data, um, and enforce these things. And so um, we are just now starting a new uh, for referenda campaign here in Portland. Um, uh, DSA for Livable Portland um, has four different um, things, and they actually build on a couple of the initiatives. The um, we have a, another minimum wage uh, bill that's um, that we're putting forward that is hoping to keep uh, wages in, at, on pace with inflation because obviously we've seen just like massive amounts of inflation and the current minimum wage isn't cutting it. So um, within that bill, we actually have um, put a uh, Department of Labor at the city to be able to monitor those things. So I think that that's, that's really critical. Um, so we're excited about that and hopefully to be able to collect some data and, and see how these things are um, affecting workers. One of the challenges that we've had with all of the campaigns that we've run in Portland is just that we can't get information. Um, Chamber of Commerce has plenty of information, but they're not gonna, not gonna share it with us. So we want actual public information about workers in the city. All right, thank you. Um, Anna, you wanna give us your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that, you know, we continue to organize and, and I've seen this and, uh, you know, the city of Austin just raised their minimum wage to $22 an hour for their employees and their contractors. And there was a wage theft uh, ordinance that was passed also earlier this year to protect workers, which, you know, we're talking about people that are not getting their wages and, and it's, it's, there are no real protections or laws at the state level and millions of dollars are owed to workers. And again, so we're talking about like really our communities coming together and then demanding from our cities and our counties to step up and do the right thing. Um, Travis County, which is where the city of Austin it is too, just passed uh, paid leave, um, uh, resolution and now those workers will have access to paid leave. So it's really is just, you know, continue to poquito, poquito, little by little, you know, continue the fight. And then we, we do this and we do it in, in, in the cities where we, we have a presence, where we're organizing in Texas, uh, four, um, four stores for Starbucks 
have unionized. And that is just incredible and inspiring. And there are more to come. There are, uh, 10, there are 10 total stores that we have in our state. So we're seeing this everywhere. We're seeing it in, in so many industries. And it's just, it's just incredible and inspiring to see um, that as we organize, we win. So, and at the same time, you know, we do that and then we turn around and next year we're walking in for a legislative session and continue this fight and just, you know, really give them a fight because uh, they are coming for our rights, they're trying to attack workers. And I think that we need to stand up together and that's what we've been doing and why all, all this other incredible wins for workers and continue to build worker power is happening still in Texas. Yeah, because you've got these defensive fights every session, but you're playing offense, and that makes a huge difference, right? Uh, Jocelyn? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot brewing uh, in New York City, in New York State. I think with the Taxi Workers Alliance, um, you know, more medallion lenders have to come to the table. So one fight that we had um, most recently was getting one of the medallion um, lenders, O'Brien Stanley Partners or OSK, um, who initially did not agree to the what's called now the New York City Loan Deficiency Guarantee Program that was finally won uh, back in November. Um, and Senator Chuck Schumer was really um, instrumental in working with the taxi union to bring that um, to a fight. Um, the taxi drivers all did this huge caravan over right to their office. I think it was in like Minnesota or something. They drove all the way over there and like, you know, actually, no, you're going to give us what we want because we fought for exactly this and you're going to do it. Um, and we had a really wonderful um, cadre organizer in New York City DSA and is now one of our socialists in office in New York State, Assembly Member Zahran Mamdani, who was really, um, you know, instrumental in getting part of that. Um, a lot of families are going to continue struggling paying the $1,100 a month. I know my family um, still is, so we're going to have to continue pushing. Um, but whether it's building out the union and the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, um, working with domestic workers and deliveristas and other folks in the gig economy, our next steps are really to work alongside Uber and Lyft drivers as well to integrate them into the union and making sure that they are considered full employees. Um, and helping out Starbucks workers, we have um, a small working group uh, in New York City that's doing solidarity organizing with Starbucks workers um, and with the Amazon Labor Union out here in Staten Island. So lots of great things coming next out of New York. Fantastic. I, I'm really impressed with the solidarity strategies and I'm impressed with how the commonalities between a place like New York City known for a certain you know level of worker militancy and in Texas where the or, you know, workers at Starbucks in both places are organizing. And the best way, of course, to overcome right to work is for everyone to join the union. <laughs> and then it, right to work doesn't matter, right? Because you've got that collective power. So um, that is, is a key to so much of this. And that relationship between these worker rights policy campaigns and union organizing cannot be emphasized enough. So thank you for your uh, very insightful and inspiring comments about your campaigns. We're going to focus on some questions our friends and comrades have put in the Q&A. It's not too late to add some more questions. Now, I'm going to pose these questions. You don't have each of you doesn't have to answer them. Whoever wants to answer them, feel free to do so. Or if you have a comment, um, please feel free to chime in. Uh, the first question is whether uh, you or your coalition members have had to na navigate strong mayor systems in your cities. I know uh, Kate talked about moving toward a, a mayor system, but how how has having to navigate that strong mayor uh, in, in in these cities, if if that has been an issue, how has that affected how you organize? And anyone feel free to jump in. Hey, do you want to do you want to take this one, or can I? I can also make a quick comment. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah. So we we in Austin, we we don't have a strong mayor system, but we we fought against a campaign last year in March that where there was an effort to try to move to strong mayor. And we really just thought that this was going to take power away from workers because the different districts represent different people. And we need to make sure that we have that representation. And also in other cities in Texas where there is a strong mayor and where we have a presence and we do work, it's definitely harder to, you know, it's definitely harder to move uh, this type of policies. So at least here in Texas and, and what we, you know, 
the work that we've been able to do in, in Austin, we've seen that when you have that representation, it's not, it, it really does matter to make sure that you have different voices at the table and you're having folks that represent different parts of the city. Because in Austin, we are one of the most segregated cities, I believe, in, in, in the country. So we absolutely want to make sure that everyone has representation. All right, anyone else? All right. Um, I can tell you that the experience in San Francisco with strong mayor is, is quite problematic in many respects. Um, now, Kate and Anna, you live in states that have large rural and suburban populations. What strategies have been successful in getting out of the cities and into the country? Kate, you want to go? Um, sure. So right now we have a statewide campaign um, that is seeking to uh, democratize our uh our electricity grid and delivery system and generation. Um, it's called uh, public power, main public power. Um, and so we're trying to uh, pull back our uh, electricity uh, to a consumer owned um, system. And uh, there's no one that's more affected by that than folks that are out in rural Maine where we lose power all the time um, and where folks are really struggling to pay their bills. So that has been one way that we've been able to get out into the rural areas of Maine. Um, and that has really changed the character of our chapter. Um, and, you know, it used to be very much a Southern Maine kind of populous area, Portland, um, chapter and now we actually have lots lots of people we, we ran a, a good petition drive um, over the last election to be able to um, collect petition signatures in small towns and yeah so that's how we're doing it <laughs> all right Anna I know uh, you know people have this view of Texas a very conservative place in fact the cities are, are not necessarily so conservative as you talked about but the rural areas particularly and then the suburban areas become kind of a uh, you know a, a key arena of struggle can you talk a little bit about that yeah I think that a big challenge for us is that a lot of the organizations that I just talked about that really are key to this work don't have a presence right in, in those places. Um, us, we do have uh, different unions and we have, you know, we work with our members and we engage them in our electoral work and then in the policy work, but it really is, Texas is a big, big state. So it's also a matter of like reach, right? It, it really, even within our own city, there's some, there's sometimes are very, uh, we walk into this challenge about capacity and like really trying to reach folks. So I think that it's a matter of like covering the ground and also just like not having a strong presence in some of these uh, rural areas where uh, compared to the cities, a lot of the organizations that do this work do, do have. And it seems like there are DSA chapters in some of those smaller areas too. So I've noticed that is kind of a helpful change. Jocelyn? Yeah, I mean, New York City surprisingly has some interesting suburbs. I live in a suburb too in Queens. Um, and when I ran my city council campaign, it was like, how are you going to do socialism in the suburbs? I mean, we already proved it with Sarah Hanna who just won her seat up in the Hudson Valley. And we did a really great job of canvassing uh, taxi workers at the same time we were doing the council campaign, many of whom actually bought um, uh, a more uh, priced out on a mortgage because they had a line of equity with their medallions. So they're like, oh, now I can afford my home. So when first the housing market crashed and then the medallion market crashed, it created an immense amount of chaos for people who finally thought they could afford to live in New York. But it also created a really important organizing opportunity for us to mobilize people in the suburbs towards socialism. And we came really close. So I think. Um, organizing people where they're at and by their experiences of how the markets really screw everything up for us was really important too. Yeah, let's remember that uh, a lot of the working class moved to the suburbs because, you know, for affordability issues, uh, for one thing, you know, at one time. And uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, work, production work, service work, office work that goes on in those in those suburban areas. So, and there's certainly a lot of Starbucks. Um, <laughs> all right, let's um, let's take another question from the audience. You know, um, I. Uh, I think all of you mentioned um, lawsuits from special interest challengers, essentially from, from capital and court injunctions. And having gone through those experiences, what advice do you have about preparing 
uh, for those legal challenges. Feel free to jump in. <laughs> I think that it's it's it is uh, it is really helpful to you're anticipating you know these attacks um, or these responses to have uh, a few things first and to, throughout the campaign also there's like a budget consideration so like really being able to have that representation is important um, for the, for legal representation I think that um, being able to uh, do rapid response also is important and like like Kate said it right like it was really hard to really like try to you know just move around like when you're in a in a courtroom however I think that as much as we can like continue to engage and organize both is important like we had uh, a public theater outside of the courtroom where uh, you know the the lawsuit was going to be heard so we really like brought in a lot of workers, a lot of uh, allies, and just continue to highlight this issue, and 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 it really uh, it made a difference, right? So I think that um, continue to and yeah, continue to engage folks to the best of our abilities, and then just consider that this are uh, that like the budget considerations are are important things. I wonder too if when you're writing the ordinance or the you know approaching how you want to design the regulation whether you do that in with a potential legal challenge in mind. So we did, we didn't have any particular um, legal challenges in mind, but we definitely looked through the um, the the language with a lawyer. Um, trying to identify anything that could be a hole or, you know, some kind of a, a thing that could trip us up. I think, honestly, the reason that um, we ended up in court over the minimum wage is that the pandemic hit really quickly. Um, and we just inserted this thing about hazard pay into our um, minimum wage um, ordinance. And I think we just didn't have enough time to really think through that and kind of like how that, you know, all would unfold. Um, so I, I say my best um, advice is don't move too fast. Um, the other thing I think that's really critical is, um, I mean, this is always a balance, but because I don't want to be called an incrementalist, I mean, I want big change, right? Like we all want big change. But the bigger bite we take, I think the more risk there is that that it's indefensible. Um, and so don't don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, try to keep your arguments um, very focused and um, limited so that when you defend them and there isn't this sprawling you know, mess that you have to have to deal with. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know that we had, um, I don't personally have a lot of inside knowledge on like legal stuff, but there was a legal team within the New York Taxi Workers Alliance and really important like legal and policy minds within the debt and finance working group of DSA that were able to support that. So I think looking within the membership to see who's able to do any heavy lifts for rapid response, like Anna had mentioned, um, but we did have a member um, Randy, who was a really important whistleblower who exposed a New York City program that was supposed to help drivers with relief that didn't disclose um, exactly what the city was doing or exactly what support was available. Um, so you had legal aid lawyers like Randy himself um, having to put themselves forward and getting barred from his own union. So I think being prepared to protect your members and being there for them um, when these things, kind of, when this kind of retaliation happens and having a calm strategy ready to prepare um, and show that your target is um, allowing this to happen. Fantastic. Yeah, it seems like comms is pretty important too, and exposing the motivations and uh, of these uh, of these legal maneuvers. Anna, did you have something to add? Okay. Great. Uh, all right. So we have another question from the audience. Um, the tipped wage is an important issue in the food service industry. I think we mentioned that a couple of times. What special advice would you have about organizing ballot initiatives on that specific question, on the question of tipped wage? Well, we're doing one right now. <laughs> Um, so we are, um, our, our new minimum wage is going to abolish the sub, sub minimum wage for tip workers. Um, 
And we're just entering into that um, now, but we feel that that is really the, the most important part of, um, of our campaign and that that's sort of the walk away point. We will not give that up. Um, and we feel that, um, you know, we took it out in 2020 because we didn't want to divide our working class base because we have so many servers in, um, in Portland. Um, but then, then the pandemic hit and we were suddenly living in a world without tips and public sentiment has changed. Worker sentiment has changed around this issue. Um, and they're just, those talking points just don't hold true anymore. I mean, we need to guarantee people a minimum wage. Um, so I, I, I say just push forward and be bold about it because a universal minimum wage is, is absolutely where we're at right now in this country. Fantastic. Uh, let me ask about, um, because really the campaigns that you've discussed have involved direct democracy strategies like ballot initiatives. And we talked about enforcement because of course these uh, kinds of initiatives can bind or help bind elected officials who don't wanna pass them themselves. And like Kate mentioned, have an administrative blockage through the city manager, but they have to be carefully worked out in advance to make sure that that'll be true, that they really do force the hand of the electeds. What have you learned about designing ballot initiatives or other proposals to force unsympathetic electeds hands? I mean, I wonder, Anna, if you got, I mean, it seems like there was a lot of um, play between the city council and your uh, initiative work. And I wonder if you felt ultimately that you're able to um, move the council or force them to, um, you know, adopt these positions through that kind of organizing and whether that uh, is a, you know, is a dynamic that ultimately worked for you. I think that, I think it, it definitely can be. I will say that for us, it really felt important to go through city council, right, and have that legislative process and making sure that there were input, there was a stakeholder process and it was vetted, right? And and after that, like the strategy was to model that ordinance to the uh, ballot initiative work. So I think that, and for example, like in San Antonio, um, really, you know, the the city of San Antonio had the option to send it to the ballot uh, or adopt it as it was written. So that was the case. So that was the case for San Antonio and, and that's what they did. But I definitely think that, um, you know, there are, there, there can be instances where elected officials are like, you know, send it to the voters. And that's just the, the easy thing to do and say, go ahead, do it. And, and we'll let the voters decide. But it sounds like it, the interplay really did work then, that uh, you're able to get the best of both worlds, in a sense. All right. Um, all right, if no other comments, let's let's go to another one. Um, Add if, if yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. No, I think um, someone mentioned earlier about like, I think it was Kate about like power mapping and make, making sure you know who like your, like ones and twos are who are definitely going to be on your side and who you kind of have to lobby to do that extra work. There's always going to be the name and shame game, right? Of like knowing where their constituents are. They always want to hear just from their constituents. And for us, I think it was important to not just have AOC being the one that was championing behind the taxi workers, but also getting like my Congress member, Tom Swazi, like on board with our congressional like sign up letter. So we needed people. Um, there was the inside and outside strategy, right? People who know the ins and outs of inner, inside government work when you're trying to get these sign-on letters going and people on the outside who are applying the name and shame pressure, getting on Brian Lehrer on radio shows, um, bird dogging electeds and all of these other strategies that we know are really clear to make it impossible for somebody to not sign on to your support letter or for your ballot initiative, city council resolution, whatever it is. Yeah, I think in Portland, um, the the ballot initiatives were a real litmus test for and drew really bright lines um, with candidates. And in some ways, we were raising conversations and questions that had never been raised before in strictly like anti-capitalist terms, right? And so, I mean, every one of our ballot initiatives challenged capitalism. And so 
and people were forced to say, look, which side are you on? Are you with the workers or are you with the Chamber of Commerce? And so honestly, the people that were blocking us from all of our initiatives before we did this, um, we've voted them out of the office. <laughs> so I, I mean, I think that it, what it showed to me is that there's a big working class base in Portland that really sides with the workers. And when they finally realized who they had elected to office, they were like, no, we don't, we don't want that. So um, yeah, so I think there's just value in having the conversation um, in order to draw those bright lines for, for um, electeds. Well, since you have the floor, Kate, let me just ask you if uh, we know that Maine's the first state to implement uh, ranked choice voting, um, and it's been a clean money state. I can't remember if it's still a clean money state. Yeah. Uh, so I just wonder if those kinds of uh, electoral uh, structural reforms have made a difference in, in your campaigns or how uh, these issues have played out. Um, yeah, they, they have, de they've definitely been, I mean, I've been involved in all of those campaigns, right? So, I mean, that's part of it. So it ends up being kind of a small organizing world. And so one campaign necessarily kind of builds on another and we end up getting a bigger and bigger coalition and bigger base. And that is all really, really helpful. Um, but as far as ranked choice voting, um, it has been really, that's been a real interesting topic of conversation around proportional ranked choice voting here, because we're kind of now having conversations about which kind of ranked choice voting we want to have. Um, and what we've discovered is that, for instance, our charter commission, um, we were, we elected a slate of very progressive socialist radical candidates who um, maybe in a different form of ranked choice voting would not have been elected. Um, so I don't know, these are all just questions that I think are left to the best left to the mathematicians, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes those can get kind of uh, pretty technical, right? Um, but um, we've talked, uh, I guess there was some mention of um, fundraising and um, kind of the importance of fundraising and organizing these worker justice campaigns. I wonder if, uh, you could talk in any more detail about the fundraising strategies that you thought worked in your campaigns. Um, well, for us, it, it, I think that Austin really just was what, you know, how we're going to base the rest of our work. Um, we had a we had a very, I would say, very limited campaign budget, um, and we were working with some national groups and really had so many uh, folks that just like inkinded a lot of the things that we use for our tactics. Like we had, uh, you know, thousands of dollars that were spent on videos that were workers in Austin that were sharing their story and that was done in kind of. So it, I think that for Austin, we had very limited budget. And then as we moved into ballot initiatives, which they're very expensive, um, we really had to like fundraise. And Austin was an example, right? Like we did it here. This It works. It works. This is something that folks care for, voters care for. And, and really just like use that uh, success, that victory as an example of, and the tactics that we use and how we were going to organize folks and how we we're going to get people out and vote and really uh, use that, like have, like, use that example as uh, in victory for, for us to be able to fundraise and fundraise to do two ballot initiatives at the same time in two cities. Fantastic. Anyone else? Kate? Or uh, so I, I think that um, in the campaign, um, it was, we were right in the middle of the Susan Collins debacle. So Susan Collins was being reelected. Trump was being reelected. I mean, I would come home to, and my mailbox would just be flooded with negative, horrible, like ads every time that, you know, it was awful. And I think people were just saturated with that. And so we tried very, very intentionally to use heart-based messaging um, and talk about how it, the campaign was People First Portland. And so we talked about the city that we love. I think we used the word love, I don't know, like a dozen times in a video that we made. Um, and we really just tried very purposely to counteract all of the negative and fear-based, hate-based messaging that we're getting. Um, and those tended to be the most effective fundraising emails that we would send. Um, the, and then I just have to, I just have to put a like plug in here for DSA because 
when it came right down to it, we needed some help and having an organization like DSA behind us to be able to just have a little bit of extra money to send out a flyer. I mean, that makes the difference. And so, um, you know, and the great thing about raising money or taking funds from DSA is it's a member based organization. And so, you know, that the funds are coming from your comrades, right? So it's like, that is just invaluable. And it's one of the main reasons that I organize primarily with DSA, because I know that that money isn't coming from some dark money source. Um, and I feel I can feel confident in saying we're raising our money in an ethical way. Fantastic. All right. Um, I want to ask about um, kind of a uh, question about what do you think the most effective strategies have been in working with unions? Because we've we've talked about the importance uh, of them and 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 yet obviously we're trying to do things here um, beyond just the arena of collective bargaining that would affect all workers. So what do you think, what have been the most effective strategy in terms of working with the labor unions? Justine, you want to go first? I mean, at least in New York City, like it's been very hard, I think, to build tight, tight relationships with labor, especially since sometimes they'll back the exact kind of candidates or elected officials who are so against many of the missions that we're trying to achieve. I'm thinking of Mayor Eric Adams here in New York City, um, who is just pummeled through a city budget that is not only defunding housing, but also education and everything else he said he wouldn't while more money goes towards the NYPD and at a historic high in our city when we have a budget surplus here, right? And so I think for us, um, it has been showing up even when you're not asked to, right? Showing up when it is those lonely two um, Amazon labor union employees who are tabling and nobody else is there. Right. A lot of the work happens also off the election cycle. Right. I do a lot of stuff with our electoral working group here at New York City DSA, especially as a former candidate. Um, but a lot of the questions come up of when are we in the fights uh, when it's not an election year? Where are we knocking on the doors to do issue based campaigns around things like with the taxi workers for Uber and Lyft and for um, even Chipotle workers who are now working up with 32 BJ um, to raise the minimum minimum wage over there, which is a really phenomenal fight. Um, and it's a challenge for us, um, not only for DSA labor, but also for New York City DSA and I imagine for so many more locals across the country um, to reckon with where are we driving a rank and file support to. We had a lot of success just doing strike support um, for the taxi workers. We um, raised money um, to help fund blankets, uh, chairs, um, Gatorades, water, everything. These like material needs that people need. We did strike support and fundraising for the Columbia Grad Student Workers Union, which has been like many decades in the fight as well. So I think it's like the basic thing, right? A lot of people now are calling for, we need a general strike in the USA, but that's not gonna happen unless you talk to five of your coworkers, right? That's not going to happen unless you start talking about how much does your coworker make versus how much do you make? Do we deserve a raise? What rights do we not have? And so, you know, for DSA as an organization, we really need to build trust with the rank and file. Um, and that rank and file strategy is priceless. And so I think for us to really cement those connections so that when it comes time, um, like say there's a project for One Innovation Queens in New York here in Astoria, um, where labor was very against the community board and the lefty DSA organizers um, who did not want to see a housing uh, project put up that did not actually have affordable housing. Um, and that's gonna be a challenge for us. And yes, it is hot labor summer. So, you know, we do have to cement those connections and I'll stop talking before I ramble in case Kate or Anna had something else to add. I mean, I will say, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the panel, but I really, particularly in Austin and in other places in Texas, and of course I work for the state fed um, now, but before I worked for a worker center and in other places, worker centers and unions don't work together. And, and we do that here. And I think that it's very unique and it's very special in Austin, we work with the trades and we work with other community organizations and other movement organizations. And I think that, you know, we've been very successful because we're doing that together. And of course there are disagreements, of course there are parts of the state where that does not happen. But at the end, I feel, um, I feel that it is, 
it is really inspiring to see, um, you know, to see someone like me that comes from like organizing immigrant construction workers going to a state federation and really feeling that this is like an extension of the work that I've been doing for uh, the last six years because I I work for a labor movement that is uh, inclusive, that is broader, that is bolder, and that fights for a union and non-union. Well, there's a lesson from Texas. That's that's a good. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Kate, last last chance because we're going to have to wrap up. You had anything to add? I I mean I think I've sort of already mentioned we we have inside outside people in the labor unions. Um, you know that it's just really critical to to keep those people close. Um, and I guess the one other thing that I would add is just involve your unions really early in the process of crafting your legislation because um, you just can't possibly know the um, the on the ground stuff that is happening. And so unless you really have um, close contacts with them early in the process, you could stumble into places where you know you could make a mistake and and um, you know end up neutralizing your your most uh, valuable ally. So yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid it is time to wrap up. And um, I just want to thank everyone who's been involved in bringing this event together, our panelists, our co-sponsors, everyone who attended tonight. Uh, look out for the follow-up email with the recording of tonight's discussion and announcing upcoming events in this series. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but want to thank you uh, for uh, the questions that, that uh, you all provided um, and the comments as well in the chat. Uh, and thanks to everyone you can't see who's been working behind the scenes. David Dualde, Brandon West, James Tierney, Sunshine Royan and Lutter, and Max Shaw from the Democratic Socialists of America Fund. Our panelists tonight have given us a lot to think about, to act on, uh, to win more worker rights justice campaigns and given us great inspiration. The follow-up email for tonight's event will have a link to the DSA Fund's YouTube channel where you can see previous events in this series and others. Check it out. Make a contribution. Get involved in some of the opportunities discussed tonight. You've seen them in the chat. And again, uh, thank you to uh, all of you and wishing you a pleasant evening. Take care. <laughs>